Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the John Moore Show on this day, Friday, the 23rd day of August, the year of our Lord, 2019. I am Tim Spencer sitting in for John today while he officiates the golf tournament in the beautiful town of Viburnum, Missouri. Anyway, we're going to go straight to our guest, who is Tom Berryhill, and we're going to discuss emergency radio communications. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Tim. How are you today in this overcast, uh, nice summer day here in the Missouri Ozarks? Well, I'm doing okay, buddy, honestly. Uh, But uh, you're right, it is overcast. The good part is the high is only supposed to be 78 today. Well, that's a blessing. Yeah, we got some thunderstorms moving up from the south, but I think it'll be fine. They don't look too terrible. That's good, Tim. Well, anyway, we'll talk about communications today. And if you want to pick a topic, we can go with that. Well, last Friday, I about beat you to death with questions. Um, How long has it been since we talked about antennas? Well, um, I guess it's been a while. I thought we talked about it a little bit. Maybe we did. Maybe we didn't. But antennas are very important. Antennas, the transmission lines or coaxial cable uh, that's used with the antenna is important. So uh, we can talk about that, Tim. We can talk about gain antennas. Um, It's always nice to have a chalkboard when you're speaking to a group but we'll do the best we can without that, and I'll try to describe and give people a, uh, an image they can put in their mind of what we're talking about. Okay. Do we want to start with base or mobile? Well, we can, uh, we can go either direction. Whatever, um, what do you think is the best? Well, we've got an hour. Why don't we, uh, why don't we do base first, and if we've got time, go into mobile. Okay, and I'm assuming we're talking about VHF, UHF, we're talking about HF. It gets rather complex when you get into HF systems. They can be very simple, but they can be quite complex, especially in a mobile uh, unit if you're putting something in the car. VHF and UHF antennas get a lot simpler because they're smaller. So we can talk about all of that. Where do you you want to go with it, Tim? You want to talk about the base stations, and you want to talk about gain antennas, transmission lines. You ask the questions, and I'll try to uh, put the answers to it. I don't claim to be an expert on any of it. I do have a lot of experience with it, but by no means am I an expert on anything. All right. Why don't we – I think most of the people that listen to Friday First Hour have a good handle on radios. Why don't we talk about tuning antennas? Is that okay? Okay, a tuning and antenna, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Sure, that's fine. Now, a lot of antennas are rather broad-banded. And I'll tell you this, Tim, when you get into the higher frequencies, once you get above HF and you get up into the VHF bands, uh, UHF bands, an antenna will be a lot more broad-banded than it will on the HF frequencies. For instance... If you're operating on a 75-meter or even 160-meter uh, ham band and you have, uh, say, a quarter-wave antenna, a vertical, or, uh, say, a, uh, uh, a dipole antenna, something like that, especially on 160 meters, and you just move your transmit frequency a few kilohertz, just a few dial clicks over, you may have to retune that antenna again. It's that critical. Uh, right. Whereas on the UHF and VHF, especially UHF, you can have um, like a quarter wave antenna for the UHF band uh, would be, um, let's see, it's about six and a quarter, let's just say six inches. So a six inch wire right. whip antenna is a quarter wave antenna on 450 megahertz. A quarter wave antenna on on the 160 meter ham radio band, which is right above the AM broadcast band at 1.8 to 2 megahertz, a quarter wave antenna on that frequency is about 130 feet. So there's a huge right. difference, and they're very very sensitive in the tuning. As a matter of fact, there's been uh, uh, transmissions on voice 
using single sideband or AM transmissions on those frequencies where the antenna tuning was so touchy that the voice peaks, the bandwidth of the signal, because of the voice peaks, actually caused the antenna system to be detuned as on voice peaks because wow. the bandwidth, yeah, the bandwidth was wide enough to cause the antenna to be out of resonance. It, it's, uh, it can be that critical. You'll never have that problem on VHF and UHF. And here's the, here's the formula. Everybody should remember this. If you're calculating like whip antennas, quarter wave whip antennas, it's 234 divided by the frequency in megahertz. And that will give you the, the length in, in feet. That's in feet. For instance, right. um, uh, yes, a, uh, at, and that tells you in feet. And, of course, you can multiply that. Uh, 234 by 12 to, if you want to calculate in inches, and that might be a little bit easier in the VHF and UHF bands. But typically what I do for mobile units, I never did like the big gain antennas and, and some of those things. I like the smaller antennas that were almost invisible, and that would be quarter-wave uh, wire-type whip antennas. And I would, uh, I would have one on my car, truck, a 19-inch whip antenna, will be um, uh, for two meters. But, Tim, what a lot of people don't realize, a lot of hams don't know this, if you're operating a 19-inch whip antenna on a car, it's mounted to the body of the car, that's a, that's a perfect uh, match, a 50-ohm, or very close to a 50-ohm match for a two-meter rig, and you'll have a very low standing wave ratio, or SWR, you can also use that antenna of 450 megahertz, and I've been doing this for decades. It will it will actually right. be three. Uh, it will be three quarter wavelengths, and every odd right. multiple of, of a quarter wavelength will still match that 50 ohm. Well, within reason, you can't go on uh, forever like that. But if uh, if you have a an odd multiple of a quarter wavelength, it will normally work just fine. And in, in some in some cases, it may even give you a little bit of gain, a little uh, you know, tiny bit of antenna gain, because it, the antenna is longer. But I've always used the 19-inch whip, whether it be uh, two meters or 450 megahertz, and it worked fine. So that's a little tip that a lot right. of the hams don't really know about, but you can do that, and you can verify that with a, with an SWR meter. I use. Uh, I use what's called a network analyzer. I use a Hewlett Packard 8753C. It's kind of a heavy instrument, a big thing, and rather heavy, but I have it on a roll around cart, and I'll actually use that to, to tune that antenna because it shows you the, um, uh, it's a vector network analyzer, and it shows you the, uh, the inductive and capacitive reactants, and it'll show you exactly where the 50 ohm. Uh, resonance is it just shows you everything about the antenna it's and you can get um, inexpensive versions uh, that are made for tuning ham antennas that are a few hundred dollars this instrument is used for uh, checking rf networks and things like that you can check transmission lines all types of things and i use it for a, a variety of purposes but um, for tuning antennas a vector network analyzer is, is a really good way to go but you can also simply use a, an SWR meter. The only problem with that is you don't know which – you have to trim the antenna. You might have to make it a little longer, a little shorter, and then, and then transmit and see how much reflected power you have. Another way around it is to um, uh, trans, move your transmit frequency rather than uh, adjust the antenna and see where it resonates. If it's too low, you have to trim a little bit off. You can clip off maybe an eighth of an inch at a time and then move your right. transmit frequency up a little, a little bit and see how the reflected power is. And you can keep doing that to you. Uh, what I try to do in two meters is get the antenna to resonate right around 146.0. So that way it's right in the middle of the band. The two-meter band is 144 to 148 megahertz. So uh, if you do that, that antenna will be broadbanded enough. You'll have very little reflected power over the entire frequency spread. Here's another thing that uh, ham operators should keep in mind, is that the larger the diameter of the radiating element, which is this whip antenna, and they're usually right. made out of a piece of stainless steel uh, wire, about a, oh, a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, something like that, 
But if you can go with a larger diameter, uh, almost like a, an aluminum pipe or, or something uh, maybe uh, half inch in diameter, the larger that diameter is, the wider the, the bandwidth of that antenna will be. So it'll actually uh, have a better uh, match over the entire band, so, which means there'll be less reflected power from one end of the two-meter band to the other if you have a larger diameter antenna. But not everybody wants to go around with a pipe sticking off the back of their car. It doesn't look too good, and it, it could be a safety hazard. But for a base station antenna, if you, could, if you can put a larger diameter antenna up, that will give you a wider uh, bandwidth, um, uh, operating bandwidth, because you won't have to retune the antenna. Uh, if you adjust it for the middle of the band, I think you'd be amazed at how well it, it matches over the entire frequency uh, spread for that two-meter band. Okay, Tom, now i got a question for you. I'm going to run by uh, a couple of things I did and see if it was good or bad, because I truly don't know. Uh, I've always had a tendency to try to skimp on money, buy used antennas, make my own. Now, I didn't have any of the gear, you know, the test equipment that you did. I did everything by math. I looked up the formulas. I did everything, you know, using regular math to come up with my links and all. And it seemed to work pretty well. It, it, um I'm not saying it worked perfect. I don't know, you know, how good I could have got with test equipment. But is, is that a fairly reliable way uh, to trim your antennas to tune them? Yeah, it really is. It's fine. And on 2 meters and 450 megahertz, it's really not as critical as you would think. Because, In fact, if you buy the, the type of antenna I use, it's called an NMO, Nancy Mosker, uh, Nancy Mary Oscar, uh, would be the phonetics for NMO antenna mount, and that's a Motorola type uh, antenna. And right. there's just a little chrome, just a little chrome ring that screws on that holds the an antenna down, and it's a. It comes from the factory of fixed length, and you order those things for the frequency band or the frequency range that you want to operate on. And they're, I think they they produce them in about a, for every two megahertz of uh, frequency spread. So. Uh, one antenna uh, rod will actually work fine over a, a plus or minus one megahertz spread. Uh, I believe that's how they do yeah. it. I, I don't remember all the details, but uh, they're not even adjustable. You just They have a little bitty uh, ball on the end so that you don't uh, get stabbed or poked with that thing. If you get close to it, it's a, a safety thing. Um, otherwise, you'd have to cut that off of there. You could trim one if you want to get one a little bit longer and trim it. As you cut the length well, down. I've done the, that. The resonance uh, frequency, the resonant frequency raises as the antenna gets shorter. Right. Well, one of the oh. things I did, you know, those old whip CB antennas that they oh they used back in the seventies. They had a big spring on them, and they went ten feet up in the air. And they attached. Yeah, those to a are vehicle. eight feet. Those are those are usually about eight feet. Right. You, well, you can I use, said you can use one of those. One. Well, that's what I did. I did use one of those, and I made a um, full-wave uh, 470 megahertz uh, antenna. Now, that thing worked like a champ. Well, uh, yeah. I don't, know what, I don't know how good the um, uh, match was, you know, the impedance match was. I mean, the only way to really check that would be with a network analyzer to get a true picture of what it's doing. Because you want to, a transmitter works best when it's, when it's dumping the power into a, a close as possible to a purely resistive load. It wants to see, it almost wants to look for a resistor instead of any inductance or capacitance. And so with a right. um, vector network, with a network analyzer, it shows you uh, if there's any reactance in there, and you can tune that out. You can you can balance that out with capacitors and inductors, but typically you just put the antenna on there and you tweak it. You get it as close as you can. Now, what you did with a longer antenna that may have given you a little bit of gain, but I don't know how the match was. You could have had a lot of reflected power. You had no way to check for that, no watt meter or anything. No, I didn't. Uh, 
but what I what I used it for, Tom, I put it on my tractor because my tractor goes through a lot of brush. I wanted something heavy and stout that I wouldn't be breaking off every week. And uh, here on the farm, uh, it seemed to work great. Well, uh, and you left the whole eight foot length for four hundred. Well, you no, were on GMRS, no, I... so about four sixty two. Yeah, no, I didn't leave the whole length. I cut it down. I did the math, got the right length of what it should be. I forgot how many inches it was, but it, I probably cut more than half of it off. Well, a full wavelength yeah. at four four hundred and sixty megahertz be around two feet. So you it, you said you left it at a wavelength, so that may have been. Uh... A quarter wave would be six inches. So uh, All right, so I know I cut it way down, but the reason I wanted to use it was with that spring and the fact that it had three mounting bolts to go into the fender. Right. You know, it was right. a whole lot better than, you know, sticking a, something with a coil up there, you know. Yeah. Um, actually, actually, I did build one for it, but I never used it. I'm looking at it right now. It's sitting on my desk. I use it for... Fluid scanner. How far? Uh, how far uh, of a distance were you uh, communicating with that setup? With the tractor? Oh, with my tractor. Uh, as far as I ever went and talked on it was probably four miles from the house. But it was. Well, you, you know, clear. you could have easily you could have easily done that with a six inch whip antenna, uh, especially since I think you said you had a repeater up on a tower. You would have easily. No, no, I never that. had a repeater, Tom. I think you're thinking about somebody else. No, what I had was a huge antenna that was at least forty-five feet in the air, if not fifty. I never okay, measured. Okay, so it. you just you just had a base station. You didn't have an actual repeater. Correct. Okay, I thought you. I thought all this time that you had a repeater set up. No. Well, anyway, right, doesn't you could have easily gentlemen. done that with it? You could have done that with a much shorter antenna easily. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in three minutes. 1 800 313 9443. Tired of being lied to by mass media? It's growing more and more apparent today that news is received less and less through standard media outlets. Even with a growing audience every day, RBN is beginning to direct more efforts into social media. Social media and the use of the Internet is fast becoming the primary source of people for news, regardless of demographic. RBN has set out to provide some of the best news on the Internet through republicbroadcasting.org and also has begun to use the tools to our advantage by way of social media. Public Broadcasting is now operating a Facebook page to function as yet another avenue to have our collective voice reach new audiences across not only America, but across the globe as well. The Facebook page features not only news, but also an RBN player to listen to our broadcast. Get involved by visiting Facebook.com slash Republic Broadcasting and liking our page and share it with your friends and family because you can handle the truth. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tim Spencer sitting in for John Moore on the John Moore Show on this, the 23rd day of August, in the year of our Lord, 2019. We're visiting with Mr. Tom Berryhill, and we're talking about pretty much all things radio. Right now, we've been talking about antennas. Tom, before we go any farther, I've got a question for you. Situation is, uh, into September, I'm going down to Georgia, help my son set up his brand new boat. One of my jobs is to install a radio and an antenna on it. Uh, seems pretty straightforward. Are there any uh, special things that you think I should know or think about before I do it? Well, depends on what type of radios you're going to install. If it's on a, a re- large lake or... It's a, your regular marine radio. Oh, okay. It is a VHF marine setup? Yes, sir. 
Yeah, that's fine. Uh, there's all types of antennas. Uh, I don't know how far they they want to talk, but I still say one of the easiest antennas to to uh, use would be the um, quarter wave whip antenna. Be about uh, at those. Let's see. I f- I forgot what. F- are they on 159? I don't remember the Marine Band or 158. That- something. Somewhere in there, yeah, they are somewhere yeah. near, and and each uh, sub sub frequency has a channel assigned. I think right. one through sixteen, and of course it picks up NOAA weather radio and all that, which is also in that general range. Uh, the antenna he bought was a good one. Uh, I can't remember the brand name, but he showed me a picture. It looks like a good one, a five foot, about half inch, three quarter inch diameter fiberglass. Um, and it, it looks like a good one, but I know with some radio systems you gotta like uh, I forgot what, there's a name for it, but I forgot what it is where you put whoops in the coax uh, of a certain diameter and a certain number of loops. Is there anything like that I need to look out for? Well, what you're doing with um, putting loops in the in the transmission line or the coax cable, what you're doing there is. That's that, that fits in better with the HF system. What you're forming is oh, okay. a common, what's called a common mode choke. You're trying to prevent radiation from coming back on the outside of the um, of the transmission line back to the radio oh, okay. equipment. I would I really wouldn't worry about that too much on that type of installation. I would take a watt meter though, a directional watt meter, or an SWR bridge, or something that will show you. Um, that you have a proper match and that the thing is there's not a lot of reflected power. I mean, I think that would be very okay. important to do something like that. Even if you, uh, y- even a, a, a cheap one would work, um, it would be very helpful to to have that information um, handy, you know, have that, have that instrument there that's going to let you have that information. You'll know that you've... Um, Put the put the thing together properly. If it's a larger antenna like that, it's probably a gain antenna. See, every time you um, uh, add some gain, it gives you. Uh, it, it doesn't make the transmitter any more powerful, but it gives the it gives the um, the distant station. Um, it, it just makes the transmitter sound louder. For every three decibels of antenna gain, uh, it gives you the it doubles the transmit power, the effective radiated power. That's what they'll call the ERP, or the effective radiated power will be uh, doubled okay. for, every, for every three decibels. And I always like to tell the ham operators, if you just remember two numbers when you're playing with decibels and power levels, it's different for voltage levels, but for power, for every three decibels of gain or loss, you either double the power. If you have a three decibel loss, you cut it in half. So if you have, if you have a 100-watt transmitter, and you have a three decibel loss, you've lost 50 watts of power in that transmission line. If you have a... Wow. Um, yeah, let's just say you have, you have a, uh, a long transmission line, and you have a 100-watt transmitter, and you uh, put out the 100 watts into this long line that has a three decibel loss, but then you put a three decibel gain antenna uh, up there on the tower, you'll make up for that loss. You'll, have, uh, uh, you'll still be uh, uh, radiating an effective radiated power of 100 watts because you've lost half of it, but you've doubled what you had left over once you got up to the uh, antenna on top of the tower. If, it's always best to use a really good uh, grade of transmission line. Uh, for tower, uh, for base stations on towers, I've always used Heliax, half-inch Heliax. Right. Uh, uh, and you know what that is, Tim? We'll explain to the listeners. Yeah, I've got about like 80 a, feet. That's good stuff to have. and. Yeah. The taller the tower, the bigger the transmission line. Uh, they have seven eighths. They have inch and seven eighths. They, they have uh, all different sizes. That stuff's very expensive, but it works the yeah, best. It gives you the, yeah, it gives you the lowest loss. Um, the the connectors for it are kind of expensive too, but it really is the yes, way to go. Are. And and that way you know you'll have uh, optimum performance from that system when you install it. This is especially important if you're operating with tall towers. Uh, things like that. If you're on a tall building or another structure and the equipment is is relatively close to the antenna within 25 feet or so, I would just use a 
RG213 or something like that. And um, there's also some uh, other types of cables, LMR400, things like that. You could use these other uh, types of cable to get the job done if it's closer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in three minutes. 1 800 313 9443. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. It's happening, ladies and gentlemen. We here at RBN are working with Front Sight Firearms Training Institute to bring our audience the best in combat, tactical, and defensive firearms training. Whether you're a private citizen who is new to firearms or you have a concealed weapon permit and want a level of training that surpasses what you've received from your local gun range, Front Sight provides priceless education and skills taught by seasoned law enforcement, military, and private citizen instructors to levels that far exceed law enforcement and military standard. With nearly a million responsible citizens trained from every town, city, and state from across the United States, Front Sight has bolstered the Patriot movement to a whole new level. Contact Dan Sutterfield by phone at 573-762-2356 or 573-465-2356 or shoot him an email at Dome Dan, D-O-M-E-D-A-N at hotmail.com. This is a limited time opportunity. Don't miss it. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tim Spencer sitting in for John Moore on this, a Friday, the 23rd day of August, 2019. We're visiting with Mr. Tom Berryhill. Uh, Tom, I'm, I'm got one more question about antennas that I'm genuinely curious, curious about and I don't know the answer to, and then we can move on to whatever you want to. Um, have you ever seen these mobile antennas that have a built-in a uh, um, ground plane, four wires sticking out at the base of the coil. And if you have, what do you think about those? Well, that that is um, that's basically a ground plane antenna. You'll notice, like on uh, UHF frequencies, the antenna, if it's a gain antenna, and and uh, VHF as well, uh, two meter antennas, uh, you may have a much longer radiating element because it's um, it's giving you some gain, and then there's there's matching transformers and coils and things like that. So you'll see the, uh, those components in that antenna, and it may be longer than uh, a quarter wavelength or even uh, a full wavelength. It'll it'll be a much longer rod. I mean, I've seen the uh, VHF antennas that are 20 feet long, but you still only right. need you all, those those are called radials, and they're at the they're at the base. They can be uh, they can come out straight out, but usually they're they're pointed down at about a Oh, I don't know, 20, 20 or twenty-five, maybe thirty-degree angle. Uh, they're they're just pointing down towards the ground a little bit. They don't have to be straight out. They can be, but usually it's better to, to have them pointing down a little bit. Those are only a quarter wavelength long, typically. I've never seen them longer right. than that because that's all you need, and that's called a counterpoise or ground plane, and that acts as your ground. You have to have something for that antenna to balance with and to work against a, a proper ground. There are other types of antennas that that uh, do it in a different way, and uh, one that comes to mind is a coaxial antenna. And you can make an emergency antenna real fast, Tim, by taking a piece of RG58 coax cable, and if it's a 2-meter antenna, just measure, just cut, it, cut off the end so it's nice, clean cut, and then measure back 19 inches, and then cut the... Um, cut through the uh, insulation and strip the insulation off of there and then use a toothpick or a, um, a screw, small screwdriver or something to work a, a hole, just work out the braid, the copper braid, open that up a little bit, and then bend it over and get in there with that screwdriver and get the center conductor to, to pry out of there. And then you, right. you've made it. Yeah, and then you can actually tape that, that uh, a coax down the side 
of the uh, you can you can well, it's hard to explain but you can have that braid coming down the side of the antenna you've just made a vertical dipole or if you can if you can do it it's kind of hard to do but if you can fold that coax turn it inside out and uh, the the braid the shield out of that coax and and slide it back down over the cable itself for 19 inches you just made what's called a coaxial antenna and then you can hang that thing up in a tree and it will work fine or if you wanted horizontal polarization just string it up like a dipole put it up horizontally and have have the right. uh, center conductor coming out 19 inches the braid going the other direction 19 inches uh, but most everything is vertically polarized on the VHF and UHF frequency so it's best to just have it straight up and down but that's that's the basis of a, a co- what's called a coaxial antenna and those actually work pretty good many times on uh, i've seen coaxial antennas used on utility uh, like power company utility trucks telephone company trucks right. they were pretty popular with them because they had so many ladder racks and they had so much stuff in the way that they couldn't put oh, antennas yeah. on the on the body so they just put a small mast on the side of the truck bed that got that uh, coaxial antenna alongside and the the radiating element or the whip part was above all the ladder racks and everything, so they didn't have any interference from that, and then they were able to um, uh, make the system work properly. So that's a coaxial antenna. I actually like those. They work pretty well, and uh, it's a good way to go if you uh, have obstructions on the vehicle, but you want the antenna to be out in the clear. That's a good way to do it. It sounds like it, Tom. What would you like to talk about next? I beat you to death on antennas for a half hour plus. Uh, well, I don't. I don't know, Tim. I, I almost anything. Um, we, uh, of course, my favorite subject is HF, but we could cover more VHF because most of the hams and the new guys get in with a technician class license, and the, and they will typically operate on two meters and and uh, seventy uh, centimeters or or the four hundred four hundred fifty megahertz band, the ham band. That's. Um, uh, I've always uh, favored the UHF band, and I had a repeater on there. It was on 449 megahertz back in the 1970s. It right. worked very, very well. It had tremendous coverage around the St. Louis region, and it was um, it was on a tall building. That that thing worked fantastic, and we had it interconnected with a telephone system and all that, so we could make phone calls with it. This was. Way before cell, uh, cell phones, there were there were mobile telephones out yeah. there, but this was this was on a hand band. It was all experimental, but we we uh, had a fun time uh, playing around with that, that thing and, and learned a lot about how mobile phones worked and how uh, full duplex uh, mobile units uh, worked. And, and full duplexes where you're transmitting and receiving at the same time into the same antenna. That's how repeaters work, and that's how a mobile right. phone works. And as a matter of fact, that's how your handheld cell phone works there is a duplexer network in there that allows uh the transmit uh power will not blow up the receiver and the receiver will not be uh desensitized or or have have its performance compromised by the transmit signal being there now you don't do that on the same frequency the frequencies are greatly removed right. from each other but still it's amazing that you can put all that transmit power into that antenna, and it doesn't affect the receiver. The receiver, the receiver is still very sensitive and will pick up uh, very weak distance signals. But that's that's an RF network called a duplexer. A lot of new hams hear about these things, but they don't know what they are. So, and they're they're right. So it's good to talk about that a little bit because if you're into repeaters and you're thinking about repeaters, very wise to learn about how duplexers work. You will need some test equipment to calibrate those things. Uh, I uh, was actually at a ham club meeting, Tim, and the president of this ham, ham club told me he tunes their duplexer for their repeater system by ear. And I was just totally dumbfounded. Oh. I, I, <laughs> I, that was in Rolla, Missouri. I couldn't believe it, that they actually told me they tuned their duplexer by ear, which I, I Were think that's almost impossible. Well, the thing works, but I'll bet you it's not working as good as it could. You really need to, to yeah. tune these things. You need, um, you at least need uh, some sort of what's called a service monitor. You need to be able to measure the um, 
uh, the power coming out of there, you need to be able to, uh, a spectrum analyzer helps quite a bit. That's probably the best way to do it. A spectrum analyzer with what's called a tracking generator. A tracking generator is just a small, like a transmitter that, that comes along and it just sweeps along there. You can set it up all different ways, but it basically allows you to tune that duplexer before it ever goes on the air. You don't have to tune it with the, the transmitter uh, and receiver itself. You just calibrate the thing uh, in your radio shop before you ever put put it out at the uh, at the remote location so every you know everything's calibrated right. just right uh, and properly in the radio shop before it gets installed that's the best way to do it but um, a lot of hams try to start tweaking things and they they see uh, screwdriver adjustments they start turning things not knowing what the results oh, are going to be and, and on a duplexer like that you can tune those uh, cavities those are cavity filters it's almost like a pipe with a with a uh, large rod or another pipe going down through the middle, it's like a piece of coax cable. It really, in fact, you can build uh, duplexers for the for the uh, UHF frequencies by using pieces of, of coaxial cable. I've seen it done. It's not the best way to do it. They're hard, very hard to tune and and get the work right. But it has been done, and it will work. But it won't give you the optimum performance. But it's a very inexpensive way to get the job done if you have the time to fiddle around with something like that. But uh, a cavity filter is really like a large diameter uh, piece of coaxial cable and with an right. adjustable, the internal part, the, the pipe on the inside is adjustable in length. And you can, it slides in and out of there until you get it to the, the proper length. And then the cavity, that cavity is tuned to that exact frequency. And then uh, you have all types they have band reject, uh, band pass. They have notch filters, so you can notch out the transmit signal at the receiver input, and uh, that type of uh, duplexer um, works quite well. So the transmit signal goes out to the antenna, but any of that transmitter energy will get it will not go into the receiver because it sees that as a short circuit and it just bypasses it and goes out to the antenna. And on the opposite. Uh, uh, situation is presented to the, on the transmit side, so it doesn't um, desensitize any of the receiver circuitry. So that, that's a, a called a notch filter, and they can be used. We're getting kind of technical, Tim. I, I don't think we should continue right. on with that, but I thought I'd cover okay. that a little bit because I know there's some hams that listen and they're interested in repeaters and how they're set up and, and how to do it. And a, sometimes a duplexer is a very Actually, uh, the concept is rather simple, um, but they can be rather complicated to get set up and tuned. And uh, another uh, tip to the hams out there, um, so much of these uh, pieces of equipment were thrown in dumps in 2013 when everything had to go to narrowband operation. Uh, the right. duplexers, they... I, I've talked about it before in this show that uh, I picked up a lot of repeaters, uh, UHF repeaters that were used at the St. Louis airport, a truckload of that stuff for $25. I didn't care too yeah, much about the me. equipment. Well, I wanted those duplex. Each one of those was a repeater. There were six repeaters in there, and every one of them had a very nice Phelps Dodge duplexer, which those things are very, very expensive when new. Uh, I mean, they could be a couple of thousand dollars a piece. And they never go bad oh, yeah. unless they get hit by lightning. There's nothing there to wear out. So a duplex of 50 years old is, is, is going to work just as good now as it did when it was purchased 50 years ago. So they're, they're really uh, handy to have. And that was an opportunity for ham operators to pick up a lot of really good equipment for scrap metal prices and put it, uh, put it back into service. Now, um, uh, these systems I purchased for 25 bucks. I was mainly interested in the cabinets, the power supplies, and those duplexers. And I was going to strip out the transmitters and receivers and maybe put something more modern in there, a different control system, things like that. And right. so they're, they're, I still have them, and I haven't really done anything with them yet. But uh, if anything, the cabinets are pretty nice, and those power supplies are very nice. So... Uh, just a tip to the hams out there, look for the older equipment. Uh, if they're going to junk it, throw it in the dump. Get the duplexer out of there and the cabinet and the power supply could be a basis for building uh, your own repeater with some uh, with some newer type of uh, 
uh, transmitting and receiver equipment, but just put the, the uh, duplexer back in the service because there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's not affected by the narrow band or wide band operation. It, uh, it'll work just fine. All right. Now, I get a, another quick question for you, Tom. It's off the subject of antennas. Uh, I do want to get into ham radios. You know me. I love radios. I've just never done anything ham. Now, I've got a tone encoder. I don't know what, it, what I would use it for, but is it possible to hook up a tone encoder to a ham radio? Well, when you say a tone encoder, was it for uh, was it a subaudible oh, tone I, for the or a, no, or it was all for, for paging for, for paging? paging, right? Right. Well, you now you can use that on on uh, the ham band, but one way transmissions aren't really allowed. They may have relaxed the rules on that. I'm not up a hundred percent on those rules, Tim. Um, there may be some workarounds for that. I can tell you this, that a lot of hams do a lot of things on there that aren't exactly, they're not exactly legal, but they're not really illegal, and they're kind of in a kind of a gray area. And I think the FCC just doesn't really look at it too carefully anymore, and they probably don't care about it a whole lot, as long as uh, you're not causing a lot of trouble or, or causing malicious interference with other hams or commercial users, things like that, you can kind of get away with a lot on there nowadays. They've okay. really relaxed the, the rules a lot. But t technically, you can do that. You just have to look at the legality of it on, uh, on the ham band. Uh, you probably had like a two-tone encoder. It sent one tone and a second three tone, tones. and that's three tones. Yeah, three okay, tone, and then there were five there was quick or five tones. Yeah, right. There was a, like a Motorola Quick Call. I think that was five tones, and and uh, some of the older pagers. I had a pager I used for my business back in the '70s and early '80s. That uh, was it was a Motorola Page Boy too. It was a pretty small pager for that for that uh, time. You know, for that. Uh, time in history it was it was rather small it was a very very nice unit it was tone and voice it would beep and then you could you could listen to the uh, message and it only used two tones so um, uh, it worked quite well though and but then they start running out of tones if you have a lot of pagers on a, a system you need additional right. tones or you run out of combinations to use so that's why they they uh, started using five tone and things like that but you can I mean technically it will work your ham equipment will is really the same as the commercial systems. They all operate basically the same. It's just on a different frequency range and different licensing requirements. But I have seen some ham radio repeaters that had some incredibly complex control systems, and they were using all types of tone signaling. Because that's really about the only way you can do it. Uh, it's the only way you can have remote control of the equipment is by tone signaling, Unless you have what's right. called wireline control, and, and use actually have a, a uh, um, uh, phone lines or at least lines that come in that uh, hook up to the equipment, and then even then, many of those actually use tones. They send tones over those wires to control the equipment. So tone signaling is is uh, quite uh, popular and still used to this day. A lot of the hams, though, we use what's called DTMF, and that's dual tone multi frequency, also right. known as touch tone. Just like a, a dial on a phone, touch tone. You push yeah. the button. I had an and, HT with one of those pads on it. Yeah, that works. Never. That works quite well. Yeah. And I'll well, tell you the truth. Uh, I've used uh, Motorola HTs that have a pad on the front, a, a touch pad on the front, a telephone type touchpad on the front to do right. remote control and it's it's pretty simple to do and the touch tone decoders are very inexpensive you can buy them on ebay for probably 15 bucks all right be right back folks uh three minutes hang in there
Welcome to Cat Folks. This is Tim Spencer sitting in for John Moore on the John Moore Show. We're visiting with Mr. Tom Berryhill. Uh, Tom, we got about three and a half minutes of air time. Go for it, buddy. Forgot where we left off, Tim. Uh... <laughs> I did, too. I had to take a bathroom break, and everything completely slipped my mind. I had a question for you, and I don't remember what it was. Oh, not a question, a statement. My idea of using a tone encoder on a ham radio is so that if the wife or one of the kids or grandkids has a HT, they don't have to have it, you know, receiving all the time. If I need to speak to a specific person, I just put in the uh, tone for that particular HT, and boom, you know, yes, it would alert them only. Yes, and that works quite well, and a lot of the ham systems are set up that way. Um, they will, uh, pa- the repeaters will pick up and pass through the uh, touch tone type signals, and you can have a decoder. Um, I think some of the current equipment even maybe has uh, decoders built into it. I know some of the Motorola HTs have that built in where you can actually program a a touch tone decoder and you can give it a an address i think it's maybe two three or four digits you can program it any way you want and therefore you can right. just ignore all the traffic on that frequency and it will only um, unsquelch and let you hear the the uh, transmissions that are are uh, being sent to that unit although there is a monitor button you can push the monitor button and hear any traffic on it that, that uh, correct on that frequency yeah that that is uh, quite feasible and a lot of ham Operator uh, uh, repeaters are set up that way. Now, there might be a lot of activity on that repeater, but maybe you don't want to listen to it all the time, and one of your friends might want to just call you occasionally throughout the day, and you can set up a code system like that, and they dial your access code, and it can be two, three, four digits, whatever you want to use, and they, right. they punch in those digits and then uh, call you with their call sign, and, and it'll come out of your... Uh, a receiver. If you're not near the equipment, you can put a call light on there to where the decoder will also light up an LED lamp or, or some sort of a, a, a lamp or whatever you want to use to let you know yeah. that a call came in, and then you can call back the other station as soon as you get back to the to your radio equipment. So it's it's pretty versatile, and it, it is uh, it's done all the time and has been for many years. It works quite well. Well, I think I want to do that if, uh, once I get my radio. I'll just bring it to you. I wouldn't have a clue where to start to hook it up. Well, it's probably best to uh, get everything connected, make sure it works properly. If you had a, a system like that set up, I'd bring over um, a service monitor. I have a small, It's, it's uh, you can look it up and see what they look like. It's an IFR uh, 500A, IFR 500A, okay. and that's a portable a service monitor. It doesn't have any oscilloscope screens. I have a larger one I use in my shop, but uh, that portable one is really good for field work because it's very small. And we could check the sensitivity. We look at the modulation levels for the tones. You always want your tone signals to be about two-thirds of the voice level. You don't want them to be full modulation. So we could set all that. You get the equipment, I'll help you set it up, Tim. All right. Thank you, buddy. Tom, appreciate it. We'll be talking eventually if I ever get your phone number. Uh, anyway, folks, we'll be back in three minutes. Uh, we're going to be talking to Dr. Lynn Wilbur. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second hour of the John Moore Show. I am your guest host, Tim Spencer. Today is Friday. The 23rd day of August in the year of our Lord, 2019. We do have Dr. Wilbert uh, waiting in the green room, as John says. I want to make a quick little announcement first. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, my show is on tomorrow from 10 a.m. till noon Central Time right here on RBN. I invite you to listen and call in. That is the Rural Survival Show. Should be a good show. Uh, good morning, Dr. Wilbert. Greetings, Tim Spencer. How are you? I am doing good, buddy. I am doing good. So, what do we want to talk about today? Oh, well, you know, there's a myriad of things that we could discuss. Um, 
I usually don't give much forethought to what I'll talk about, but it, we usually get going pretty good here. But I'd just like to start where we left off last week with the development of okay. the human being. Now, I happen to believe that there is a creator that created everything that we know. Pardon me? I said I do oh, you too. too. Yes, absolutely. And so I also happen to believe that creation is perfect. In the I agree with that also. We, uh, you know, instead of saying God, scientists have come to the conclusion that something had to design and create what we know this planet and other planets in the universe. Something had to do that. And the analogy that I use all the time is I, I happen to like pizza. When I was in chiropractic college, my... Uh, my nutrition instructor tried to get us to believe that pizza was a complete meal. It had vegetables and cheese and grain. And so let's say you're going to make a pizza at home. You get a nice whole wheat uh, crust, and then you have all of your ingredients, and then you take those ingredients and put them in your hand and throw them up in the air, watch it land in a perfectly laid out pizza. No, it doesn't do that. Right. You have scrambled pizza. No. So, we wish it did. <laughs> and even in the world of, of um again scientists, the science said scientists said one time that scientists are merely men who observe God's behavior. And I happen to agree with that. We can measure it. We can. We know it's repeatable. The sun's going to shine every day. It will never stop shining. And they have assigned, scientists have assigned the term intelligent design. Intelligent design. So that leaves them open to say, well, we don't know if it's an entity or not, or it was, but it had to be a design. Exactly. And then some people hold on to the Big Bang Theory, which doesn't make sense to me, but if right. you want to believe that, I have an explanation for you. When I was a child, I used to do fireworks around the 4th of July, uh, cherry bombs, firecrackers. Have you ever right. lit a firecracker and see what happened to it? You, you can only find pieces of the paper in some places. Correct. Right. That's what happens when there's a Big Bang. So even if the Big Bang Theory was true, who orchestrated the outcome of the explosion? It had to be a creator. So if you believe that, right. that still says that there's an intelligent designer of the planet and the known planets that we um, know about. I happen to be a, a student of Astronomy, one of my favorite subjects, and not too long ago, I'm, I'm thinking it's within the last few years, they have been able to observe 10,000 galaxies, all of them right. bigger than the Milky Way galaxy that we live in. The smallest galaxy with the smallest sun is 10 times bigger than our sun. I'm going, okay, it's going to be a little while before I can wrap my head around that one, but they see it. They discovered it. Yeah, right. Like Christopher Columbus discovered America when people were already here. That's not a discovery. <laughs> yeah. That's an observation. And so since creation is perfect and mankind is part of creation, so the question arises, what part of man is perfect? Mm. I'm not following you, uh, Dr. Lynn, because I know there's something wrong with my knee. No. No, it's not anything wrong with your knee. It's how your lifestyle has developed over the years, and this is how your knee has responded 
We happen right. to be a perfect stimulus response organism. Perfect. Let me give you an example. I'm sure you've done this. You, you accidentally breached your skin, a cut, and you started bleeding. Well, right. The first thing you did was cover the wound, stop the bleeding, clean it, make sure you had an antibiotic ointment on top of it, and then you covered it, and then the healing process had already begun. However, what part of healing the cut did you oversee after that? None. 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 Automatic. Your survival system looked at the cut as a threat to your survival. And so immediately it went to work to heal the breach in the skin. Now it heals and scar <clears throat> Excuse me. It heals in scar tissue, but the cut is completely sealed because your survival system, your subconscious, which is in charge of that, knows that if the bacteria outside get into your body, inside your body, there's havoc. Because those organisms right. would love to live inside you, and you get to provide a five-star luxury hotel and restaurant. But you give no thought to the healing of the cut. But it heals. It sends coagulating cells there to stop the bleeding and put a little scab on top of it. Now, do you see it send dermoblasts or dermoclasts first? What white blood cells do you see? Microphages basophils, eosinophils, you have no idea. And depending on your age, right. if you were four and cut yourself, you, it would heal in three or four weeks. If you're 40, it takes a little yeah, longer. If you're 80, it takes a little longer. But the cut will heal. Now, this, it took me a long time to figure this out. But it's true. Any condition... Anybody thinks they have, if you think you have a condition, first of all, is instead of a heart attack. Doesn't matter what it is, right. from cancer to arthritis to infection, it's instead of a heart attack. And the reason why is because we used to be one cell big. The heart, lungs, the liver, all of your organs, the nerve system, the skin, all came from one single fertilized cell. So they're all in communication all the time, and that cellular communication is instantaneous throughout the 100-plus trillion that we have. They maintain that cellular communication. And so as a result of that, your survival system knows that there's a contract with the heart. And in this country, heart attack is still the number one way people die, men and women, women more than men. I haven't figured that one out yet, but women die of heart attack more than men in this country, and it's totally preventable. Right. And there's a hospital here in St. Louis, if you survive a heart attack, they make you join the heart attack club. I survived the heart attack club. They give you a little cap and a T-shirt. They teach you how to reduce stress. They teach you how to exercise. They teach you how to get out in nature and enjoy nature, and so if it's if, if that's good to keep you from having another heart attack, it would be great to keep you from having any heart conditions. And so, sense. no matter how many times you cut yourself, unless you're in the very end stages of life, your survival system will heal the cut. Now, this is a profound statement when I learned it. The healing of a cut and the condition you think you have are both solutions to a life-threatening emergency. Mm. Yep. Well, let's ponder on that for a minute. Whatever condition you have, whether it's any condition, you name it, any itis, any infection, anything aside from trauma, anything aside from physical trauma, is healing. It is the body's 
perfect response to the stimulus that you've given it. And this stimulus, it was uh, really studied and made well known in the early 1900s by a physician, Austrian physician. His name was Hans Selye, H-A-N-S-S-E-L-Y-E, Hans Selye. And he's touted as the father of stress. He studied the stress response. He calls it the general adaptive syndrome. How your body responds to the stressors of life. The number one stressor in life is strong emotions that are less than positive. Because we tend to think 24-7, we're just not aware of it. Right. You can ask the person, oh, what were you just thinking? Oh, nothing. No, no, no. You're conscious. You're awake. You were thinking something. You just weren't aware of it. It's called random thinking. Very, very, very dangerous. I have a saying. Think about what you're thinking about while you're thinking about it. And if it doesn't make you feel good, change the thought instantly. No one tells you what to think, but if you knew the devastating destruction created by an emotion, a thought, feeling, an emotion that's less than positive, that's anti-nature, anti-creation, and man, one man, we're the only ones that can do that, use our minds to contaminate our bodies, but we do it all the time without knowing what it is we're doing. The right. less than positive thought creates an acid chemical that is different from the acid that we get from living. Like when you breathe in, you breathe out. That's CO2. That's acid. The body's designed to get acid out as fast as possible because the heart can't live in an acid environment. You right. never hear a diagnosis called heartitis. But you'll hear gastritis, you'll hear uh, myositis, or whatever itis it is, but never heart itis. Now, the bag around the heart, the sac around the heart, is called the pericardium. That can right. explain. That's called pericarditis. That's a real serious condition. So the brain has a contract with the survival system to say, hey, you know what? I will ask anybody, anybody in the body, to take on the brunt of the acid that we're producing with lifestyle, and we'll keep you happy, heart, because we know if you check out, we got to check out with you. And so the yeah, brain that, that that works that way. Yes, it does. It's a perfect system. And so here's a common example. You're using up all of your minerals. That's what you need to neutralize acid of living, whether it's from what you eat or how much you exercise or not, what you're thinking, how you're breathing. Life in and of itself will produce acid. We are alkaline by design, meaning the more alkaline your cells are, the healthier you are, but we're acid by function meaning that cells, when they function, produce acid, and that acid is carried away by the circulatory system or your lungs expel CO2, and it keeps the blood, the pH of the blood. Now, this is important. The pH of the blood is 7.35 to 7.45. That's a narrow one-tenth range, but on the pH scale... 7.35 to 7.45 is slightly alkaline. Okay. The blood stays alkaline for as long as you are alive. Within that narrow pH range, one-tenth, and it never changes. It never changes. If it goes 7.46 or 7.34, you have minutes left to live. That's wow. how sensitive the system is. And so when you're producing, and I call it stinking thinking, <clears throat> again, if we knew the destruction that 
emotional upsetness created for you, we spend this moment forward and the rest of our life learning how to control our emotions. And I've been asked this many times with Dr. Wilbur, I just can't seem to control my emotions. Well, you began by controlling your thoughts. And contrary to popular opinion and belief and, and beliefs, you only have one thought at a time. The brain is incapable of thinking more than one thought. They just come in rapid succession. And sometimes we don't keep track of them. But you only have one thought, and the more you practice that, and you could tell, you have a thought, um, you know, I say, oh, that don't feel good, and then your body sends this energy back to your brain, and you realize that you're upset. That's the emotion. The emotion is the energy feedback from your body. It's the result of the feeling that you had, which is the result of the thought. So it's most important that you control your thoughts, control your feelings to control your emotions, because humans were not supposed to get emotionally upset. We're not All right, ladies and gentlemen, upset. we will be back in three minutes. Call in number is 1 800 313 9443. Give Dr. Wilbur a call with your questions and comments. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Talk Right, the conservative app offered by TalkStream Live that caters exclusively to the conservative talk radio community. Here you'll see only talk shows and podcasts from the conservative right, all the big broadcast names and online digital shows in one place. Talk Right makes it easy to find all your favorite conservative talkers with all the upscale features you come to expect from TalkStream Live. Keep up with the fast-paced political world. Download Talk Right today from Google Play or the App Store. The reviews for Extendivite are amazing. Here are some from Amazon. September 2018. Extendivite works in keeping my blood pressure in the normal range. I've been using Extendivite for many years now. May 2018. Great product. I use regularly and I rarely get sick. March 2018. This product has relieved what appeared to be angina pain in my chest and shortness of breath after climbing stairs. I'm quite happy about it. February 2018. My husband, son, and I have been using this product for a few months now, and we have noticed an improvement in our joints and blood pressure. Tell us your story. Get Extendivite today. To order, call 1-877-928-8822. That's 1-877-928-8822. Or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. 